Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction, Greg, and uh, it's a real, real pleasure to be here. I'm um, extremely happy to have been stolen away from <laughs> Eastern Washington, where uh, I checked on the uh, Facebook page of my graduate students, and they're saying, bring on the snow. <laughs> so I'm glad that I won't be uh, shoveling the driveway this year. Um, so I want to talk to you today about uh, research that I've been doing in my lab um, while I was at Washington State, uh, ideas I started at Washington State, but um, things that I've been doing uh, since I moved down here uh, to UCLA. Um, my lab is interested in studying patterns of diversification. And one of the most fundamental patterns of biodiversity is that it is unevenly distributed across the tree of life. So in one of the groups that we work on, uh, tetradoniform fishes, a group that includes uh, puffer fishes and uh, porcupine fishes and box fishes and trigger fishes, um, this pattern is readily apparent. There are over 400 species in this group, but they are not evenly distributed across the 10 families in the order. In fact, uh, the puffer fishes contain almost half of them. And there are similar observations that can be made about the distribution of uh, phenotypic uh, disparity across this group. Now, evolutionary biologists have recognized this, uh, this pattern and have thought about it for a long time, and we have a lot of ideas or frameworks for thinking about um, why we would expect to see more species richness or more morphological disparity in some lineages compared to others. Um, these include ideas that might, might be as simple as clade age. We might expect uh, clades that have been around for a longer uh, period of time to simply have had more of a chance to accumulate differences or species than young clades. Um, we also have ideas that differential uh, diversification can be the result of ecological, op ecological opportunity or adaptive radiation. Um, this, these may be fueled by the evolution of key traits, um, wings, uh, jaws, uh, even uh, genomic expansions. And these ideas will be um, cropping up in my talk today. Um, I've also done some work showing that a decoupling of morphological and mechanical evolution can lead to differential patterns of morphological diversification in clades that have complex traits. So today I want to focus on um, adaptive radiations. Um, this is an idea that has been around. You can trace the ideas, uh, the origin of this idea to Darwin, but it um, gained some some uh, concrete formulation uh, during the evolutionary synthesis. Um, here's a picture from Temple and Mode by Simpson that's showing um, an uh, expansion, an invasion into multiple new adaptive zones of a lineage over time. So the idea here is that some event, some, um, the evolution perhaps of some uh, advantageous trait allows a clade to suddenly um, inhabit many different, uh, what Simpson called adaptive zones. Uh, we might think of these as niches today. And this is accompanied by rapid morphological diversification and species diversification. In 2000, Schluter um, extended ideas and really uh, quantified them or, or uh, extended the conceptual ideas of adaptive radiation in his book, uh, Ecological Adaptive Radiation. Um, and defined adaptive radiation as ecological and phenotypic diversification or diversity rapidly multiplying lineage. Schluter identified four criteria that could be used to 
identify um, a clade that was adaptively radiating. And I just want to point out that three of these, common ancestry, rapid speciation, and phenotype environment correlation, are all um, the signatures of adaptive radiation that uh, may be detected using phylogenetic approaches. So I want to talk to you about those today. Um, now, Schluter's book was published almost 10 years ago, um, but there's still a lot that needs to be done um, in order for us to understand the influence of adaptive radiations on shaping patterns of biodiversity today. This is from a, a recent review by Gaverle and uh, Losos um, that's highlighting some of the gaps in our knowledge. Uh, my talk today will be broken up into two parts. First, I'll present some emp empirical examples that show how we can use phylogenetic approaches to test some predictions of ecological adaptive radiation models. And the second part of my talk will focus on how we can use a new phylogenetic methodology to study diversification patterns at really broad scales. So uh, I'll begin with an empirical example uh, that focuses on one of the families of the tetradoniforms here, the trigger fishes. There are about uh, just over 40 species of trigger fishes. You can see they're um, variable in their color and their morphology, but they're they're characterized, their distinction is their locomotor mode. They have these um, paired uh, dorsal and anal fins that they um, oscillate or undulate in a coordinated fashion to locomote through the water. And this is called uh, ballistiform swimming, or ballistiform locomotion. So this um, locomotor mode characterizes the whole group and um, what we wanted to do is understand whether this unique uh, swimming mode um, influenced patterns of morphological evolution in the group, and also to ask whether there was any evidence for um, the radiation, the biodiversity that we see in trigger fishes to reflect an adaptive radiation along this locomotor axis. So to address those two questions, we uh, took a, a morphometric approach. We um, took pictures of these trigger fishes, um, of 26 species of these trigger fishes, individuals per species, and used a landmark-based uh, geometric approach to quantify shape. Um, I'm going to show you the results of this analysis, um, where we look at the, the major shape descriptors of the dorsal fin and the body. Um, so these are the relative warps. These are the same thing as principal components in this case. Um, and so you can think of this relative warp one as describing the major axis of shape variation in the dorsal fin. And what I'm showing you here are the extremes along this uh, relative warp. So on one extreme, we have fins that have a, what we interpret to be a, a short leading edge of the first dorsal fin ray. Others that have a tall, on the other extreme, we have a tall leading edge. Um, relative warp two um, describes fins that have relatively long fin bases uh, versus relatively short fin bases. We did the same analysis, same analysis for, analysis for the body shape. And um, so here's relative warp one, uh, which is describing a deepening, an overall deep body, uh, especially posterior to the pectoral fin, as well as some expansion of the rostrum. Um, versus the opposite uh, directed movement on the other end of this relative warp. Uh, relative warp two um, really describes sort of a scrunching anteriorly um, on this end of the relative warp versus the, an opposite uh, rotation of the, many of the points of the body um, on this end of relative warp two. So we have some shape descriptors. Uh, for the and the body, and we want to know what the pattern of evolution of, of the fins is and whether it's correlated with patterns of evolution um, in body shape. Now, we, it's important to take, um, to incorporate the, or to accommodate the kind of relationship when we're making biological comparisons. These um, species that we've measured um, on the trigger fish logic are not all dependent as most statistical methods will assume. So to accommodate uh, shared ancestry, we used a method called phylogenetic generalized least squares um, to analyze uh, patterns of correlation between these shape variables. 
And we used a tree of phylogeny that we had uh, previously published. I'm just going to show you the results of um, some of our analysis here. We, we asked, do fin shape axes evolve independently? That is, do uh, relative warp 1 and relative warp 2, which are orthog orthogonal axes of uh, shape descriptors for the living trigger fishes, have they evolved in a correlated fashion or an independent fashion? And we find that um, they are evolving independently as well. Um, and we found the same pattern for the body shape axes for relative warps one and two. The median fins, um, however, show uh, a, a strong pattern of correlated evolution. And this makes sense given what we know about their function, that they're both moving um, in a coordinated fashion. We find very strong evidence for the coordinated evolution of relative uh, warp one of the dorsal fin and the anal fin. And, uh, uh, whoops, it's two. Um, for the dorsal fin and the anal fin as well. And then we asked if fin shape was correlated with body shape evolution. And this is a little bit more um, complicated. What we found is that um, there was no correlation between the evolution of the, uh, the height of the first fin ray, of a relative warp one on the fin, dorsal fin axis and body. So there's no significant relationship there. But we did find that the second axis, which is related to the length of the base of the fin, is, shaped, is tracking both of the body shape axes. And so to come back to our first question, has, how has this swimming mode influenced patterns of morphological diversification? We find that the major axes of the median fins are evolving together. Um, but the major axes within each fin are evolving independently. And that the uh, fin ray height is evolving independently. So now I want to come to the second question. Is there any evidence that these patterns of shape diversity that we see in trigger fishes, and in fact the trigger fish um, species richness that we see today, is there any evidence that that is the outcome of an adaptive radiation? Well, we can make some prediction um, about patterns that we would expect to see if, if they were. And one of these is that we would expect um, if trigger fishes were following some kind of uh, we're radiating along an ecological um, axis that we would expect that subclades were um, differing from each other early in their history. In other words, if um, adaptive radiation is characterized by um, invasion of new ecological niches, and if their triggerfish morphology is tied to their ecology, then we would expect that these um, early differences were exploited um, in the history uh, at the origin of the triggerfish. And the second prediction is that species diversification was fast early in their history and then slowed down as these um, opportunities for ecological speciation uh, were no longer available. So to test this first prediction, um, we use a phylomorphospace approach and um, also uh, subclade disparity through time. So I'll show you the phylomorphospace approach first. This is simply taking your phylogeny and sticking it into a morphospace. So here's a morphospace that's described by relative warp one for body shape and fin shape. And here's the dated phylogeny. I'm just going to drop it into the uh, morphospace and look at the distribution of the tip species as well as the reconstructed um, ancestral nodes in this morphospace. So this bullseye represents the ancestral state of the trigger fishes, the reconstructed ancestral state for the body shape and fin shape. And these symbols correspond to genera of trigger fishes. And so what you can see is that there's a generally strong clumping of genera within this morphospace. Um, and if you look at this pattern of uh, splits along the tree, these uh, ancestral nodes, you can see that, that these, um, from the ancestor, um, sort of an explosion into these different regions of morphospace. And I'll, this will become more explicit if we examine another metric, subclade disparity through time. Now we can think about um, if we have a tree and we've measured a couple of traits for the taxa on this tree, we can think about two ways that this um, variance, that these traits are distributed across the phylogeny. In one case, um, the, we might find that these subclades are strongly overlapping with each other in their morphological disparity, that they've converged upon each other. 
that were the case, then we would expect if we sample the variants that we find in this clade would overlap with the variants in the red clade. An alternative way that the um, disparity could be distributed on the tree could be that subclades strongly differ from each other. So that the disparity in this clade, uh, the total disparity in the data set is distributed among the subclades rather than within the subclades. And so this, uh, we can calculate the subclade disparity at each point in the phylogeny where there's been a split and get a picture of how uh, disparity has been uh, distributed across the phylogeny over the clade's history. And uh, what this plot shows is uh, time on the x-axis and the uh, relative subclade disparity on the y-axis. Um, we can generate an expected distribution for the um, partitioning of disparity uh, by evolving traits along this phylogeny under a Brownian motion model, under a random walk model. And then we can compare that null distribution indicated by the dotted line here to a pattern where the subclades um, overlap more than we would expect, where there's been a lot of convergence. And if we find that, then we would s expect to see um, each time we assay for average subclade disparity, we would expect to have more overlap than predicted by the null. Uh, on the other hand, if subclades have evolved into distinct regions of the morphos, um, if disparity is partitioned uh, among the subclades rather than within them, we would expect to find um, the relative average subclade disparity across the tree below this null expectation. So when we come back to the trigger fishes and we look at average subclade disparity through time for the fins and the body shape, we see a strong pattern of uh, lower than expected disparity uh, within each subclade. And so this is consistent with the idea that early in the history these lineages were uh, evolving into distinct regions of the morphospace. A second prediction of adaptive radiation is that lineages were multiplying quickly. Um, we used a test, MCCR test, to ask whether the, the timing of splits in that trigger fish tree are different from the expectation of the timing of splits in a tree where the rate of diversification has been constant. And this um, can be assessed using a, a statistic called the gamma statistic developed by uh, Pibbis and Harvey in 2000. Basically, this uh, gamma statistic works by finding the um, midpoint of the waiting times or the split times in the phylogeny under a constant rates model. And if that is the case, then you expect your gamma statistic to be zero. If a tree has lots of splitting events that are late in the history, that are towards the tips, then you end up calculating a gamma statistic that's greater than zero. If you have early splits in the tree to, to this midpoint, then your gamma statistic is negative. So a, a negative gamma statistic is, um, if it's negative enough, then you can reject the null model of a constant in favor of a model where there's been early diversification that's fast, that is slowed through time. And so these, this shows the uh, log, linea log number of lineages through time for the trigger fishes. And these splits are sort of the raw data for that MCCR test. Um, and what we would expect is under a constant rates model, um, under a constant rate of diversification, we would expect there to be a linear accumulation of of uh, clades of species in the phylogeny with time. But you can see, I think, there's a, there's a little bit of a curve on this log lineage through time plot. And that um, is consistent with the MCCR test, which approaches significance. Uh, the gamma is slightly negative. Uh, we've also fit some other models of density-dependent diversification versus constant rates models. And the density-dependent models tend to fit these branching times best. So this is perhaps support. Um, for adaptive radiation that involves both species diversification and um, morphological um, differentiation. So to here, we found that ballistiform locomotion uh, appears to constrain several aspects of median fin evolution. Um, but we also found that there are axes that evolve independently um, in the fin and the body. And we found evidence that the tempo of uh, fin and body shape uh, locomotion is consistent with an adaptive radiation hypothesis and perhaps the tempo of lineage diversification as well.
Okay, so now I'd like to uh, present a second empirical example uh, with another group of uh, fish, a little more derived, but... <laughs> um, uh, and this is work that uh, has been headed up by uh, my postdocs, uh, Graham Slater and uh, Francesco Santini. Um, and we have uh, become interested in the pattern of diversification, the temple of diversification in cetaceans. Cetaceans are a very charismatic group. Um, they're the largest animals. They, the clade includes the largest animals that have ever lived. In fact, the uh, range of size that's spanned by cetaceans is pretty impressive. It approaches four orders of magnitude. Um, the appearance of the modern fauna, though, is um, much later than the uh, appearance of the first forms that uh, transitioned into the water. Um, so the modern cetaceans belong to a group called the Neocetes, of so the Neocetacea, uh, and they appear about 34 million years ago. But there were 20 million years of evolution of a paraphyletic assemblage called the Archaeocetes that uh, predated these Neocetes. In fact, um, around the time that the Neocetes appear, there's heavy extinction of, the, of many of the archaeocete lineages. And this has given rise to the hypothesis that um, the neocetes, uh, that they were superior ecological competitors to the remaining archaeocete lineages, um, and ideas for the adaptive radiation involve um, or span the range of uh, sort of sociality, increased brain size, echolocation, or the evolution of key traits like baleen. But these ideas have never been rigorously tested. So um, we decided to um, use comparative approaches to test some specific predictions about the pattern of diversification of the cetaceans. In particular, we wanted to ask whether the speciation um, was a strong uh, suspicion that body size and diet were going to be closely linked, that body, in fact, the literature um, shows a strong correlation between body size and dietary type. Um, so we focus on whether diet explains body size evolution. So here's a phylogeny that we constructed using previous data available in GenBank. Um, that we time calibrated this phylogeny using uh, eight, eight fossils. And here are um, pictures of representatives of the major clades here. Um, and we use this phylogeny to test for patterns of speciation. So I'll show you the results of the MCCR test again for the cetaceans. I'm also going to introduce a second method called Medusa. Uh, this is a method I'll talk about in the uh, later part of my presentation. But the basic idea with Medusa is to ask whether there's evidence for a shift in diversification rate um, in some subclade of the phylogeny. So in contrast to the uh, pattern that we saw in the trigger fishes, if we do the MCCR test on the cetaceans, uh, positive, if you look at the log lineage through time plot, it appears nearly linear. Um, so we're not surprised that um, we can't reject a constant rates explanation for the modern cetaceans. If we look within the cetaceans for evidence of rate shifts using this Medusa procedure, which I'll describe, um, we do find evidence for a rate shift um, on this clade, which includes most of the delphinids. And so this is saying that uh, most of the action of uh, diversification within the modern cetaceans um, has happened within the um, most of the dolphins. These guys are evolving about three times faster than the rest of the clade. Okay, now let's turn to uh, studying patterns of body size evolution. Um, we collected body size information from the literature and uh, used that phylogeny that I just showed you again to ask whether subclades evolved into distinct regions of body size morphospace over their early history. And again, we find a pattern um, where the amount of uh, size variation is partitioned within subclades rather than among subclades. And this is consistent with the adaptive radiation hypothesis. To further explore body size uh, evolution and whether, body si whether diet explains body size evolution, we used another comparative method that's based on the ornstein uhlenbeck process. And um, this is a model that allows you to specify uh, sort of the strength of selection on lineages that move away from that optimum. It's not, lineages are free to evolve randomly under this model uh, until they get too far away from that optima. And then the further away from the optima they are, 
the stronger they're pulled back towards it. And so we used a model fitting approach where we assigned one optima to the entire tree uh, and also where we allowed different um, taxonomic groups to have different evolutionary optima. And we also compared those models to models where body size could just evolve randomly across the phylogeny. And so when you're doing this kind of model fitting procedure, you have to um, paint your phylogenies to reflect what, what branches and what clades are in uh, what evolutionary optima or under each uh, different optima, uh, under each di different regime. So these are some of the regimes that we examined. And we had the fit of the model using um, an AIC approach and a cocky information criterion approach. This is really a function that includes the likelihood plus a penalty for the number of parameters in the model. So here's um, some of the models that we compared. Here's the uh, AIC score. Lower AIC scores indicate better fits um, of the model. And we have here are the Akiki weights. These are rescaled AIC scores of all of the models that we considered um, that show the relative strength of support for each of the model. And you can see that 98% of the Akiki weight. Um, so here's that uh, dietary model. Here's the feeding categories that we used. And uh, what we can conclude is that body size, um, is that diet is a very strong explanation of body size evolution within this group. OK, so if we come back and ask whether uh, cetaceans fit a classic model of adaptive radiation. Well, it's not a classic model because we don't see any signature of rapid initial lineage diversification. But we do find that body size evolution is consistent with that hypothesis. Now, there is a good fossil record of cetaceans, and um, it's possible that extinction has of uh, lineages has masked um, this signature. If there was early rapid diversity. In um, followed by a lot of extinction, we may not be able to detect it from looking at the living cetaceans themselves. And this really points out to a limitation of studying diversification without considering fossils right now. Um, and this is something I'll come back to at the end of my talk. Um, this is a, a, a problem that we're, we're dealing with in our lab, as, um, but it's also recognized by the, I think, by the part two of my talk, and ask, um, how can we integrate phylogenetic information, taxonomic information, um, and other kinds of information to study uh, exceptional radiations at really broad phylogenetic scales. And also explore how we can test causal explanations of diversity. OK, so as you are all aware, this uh, informatics revolution, sequencing revolution um, has resulted in increasingly large amounts of genetic data being deposited in, into um, depositories like GenBank. And uh, it's becoming more and more possible large phylogenetic trees um, by assembling the data that's uh, being deposited into GenBank. Um, there are also major initiatives by the National Science Foundation. It's a very exciting time to be a systematist, to be a phylogeneticist, um, because we're going to have more and more insight into um, in shape. But as an evolutionary biologist, I'm really interested in what we can do with those phylogenies after we've reconstructed them. So this is a, um, a visualization of a large portion of uh, what's in GenBank right now, if you try and make a tree out of it. And um, as we get greater and greater phylogenetic scope, we need to have methods to genomes, parts of the genome, and looking for um, some unusual signature of selection or something, perhaps. Um, and so we have uh, introduced a method called MEDUSA, uh, Modeling Evolutionary Diversity. And I'll explain this method uh, over the next few slides. This method really extends work that's done by Nee and Raboski um, that allows a birth death model to be fit to an incompletely resolved phylogeny. And so here's an incompletely resolved phylogeny. We know what the timing of the splits along the backbone is. And we can use um, to those waiting times. Now, these triangles represent the species richness of unresolved groups. And you might think that we don't know that much if we don't know what the relationships are within a triangle. But actually, if we know how many species there are, and we have an idea from the back unresolved triangles,
then we have a whole series of ages and richnesses. And we can actually fit a birth death model to this distribution of clades uh, of, uh, of unresolved to recently um, uh, figured out. There had been previous attempts in the literature that were incorrect. But, um, and so we can um, fit a birth death model to study diversification even if we don't have complete species level resolution for a group. Medusa extends this approach by asking whether um, allowing more than one uh, rate shift across that phylogeny is justified by the data. And I'll give you an example. Um, the first thing that we do is, is check whether a pure birth model, a model where there's no extinction, um, fits worse than a birth death model. We use uh, AIC in this, uh, in this approach, so uh, scores are better. So in this example, if we fit a pure birth model to this tree, we get an AIC score of 202. Allowing extinction under a birth death model um, is a substantial improvement to the fit of that tree. So we would prefer the birth death model over the pure birth model. And now what we're going to do is move through each of these uh, branches in the phylogeny and allow the rate, rate and the death rate to shift and recalculate the likelihood in the AIC. So for example, if we let the, rate, the birth rate and the death rate shift here, then we have a birth rate and the death rate for this clade and a birth rate and the death rate for the remaining part of the tree. And we can uh, calculate the AIC for um, a model where the rate shift occurs here. We now have four parameters, so a rich model, because we have two birth rates and two death rates. And we see that the AIC is higher than the AIC score was for the regular per, uh, birth death model. So not prefer this model. And we can find other bad models in other parts of the tree. But if we look down here, where we have 950 species, then we see that there's a strong improvement in the model if we allow the rate to shift on that branch. And so we would keep this two-rate model and work through the tree again to see if we would uh, prefer allowing the rate to shift in three places. But in fact, every other um, place where you allow the rate to shift is worse. So we would just keep um, a model where there's a rate shift on the phylogeny here. So let me show you how this works in practice. Um, we studied code rag sequences for representatives of major lineages of, nap, of jawed vertebrates. And we produced a phylogeny. We um, dated this phylogeny by scouring the, the, uh, the literature for fossils that could be used. This is work that uh, Francesco Santini and his colleague uh, Giorgio Carnavale were, were instrumental in performing. Um, and then we assigned the diversity of living vertebrates to representatives of the uh, to representatives of tips that we had in the phylogeny. So we collapsed the tree down to just representatives of major lineages and attached if um, there's evidence for rate shifts across. What we find, in fact, is that there are nine different places on this vertebrate tree of life where the rate of diversification appears to have changed. And they, the uh, yellow boxes uh, indicate places where exceptional vertebrate radiations. Um, one of them are the percomorphs. Um, the spiny rayed fishes are about 140 million years old and have close to 16,000 species. This includes um, most of the fishes that you would see on coral reefs, for example. We find evidence for a rate shift on neoaves. This is a subclade of birds. It includes uh, most of the birds, in fact. Uh, and it uh, it's, has more species than when you would expect given its age. We find evidence for a rate shift on a subclade of mammals. Not all mammals, not all eutherian mammals, but the boreal eutherians. Now this subclade does contain most of the uh, mammal species. We also find evidence for rate slowdowns in three clades, um, including the coelacanth and the lungfish here, which have a very small number of species given there, and the tuatara, as well as the crocodilians. So what we can conclude from um, this uh, analysis is that, uh, first of all, more than 80% of the species diversity of jawed vertebrates is the outcome, is a product of, of rate accelerations. Um, that this suggests that um, the differential pattern of species richness that we see in lineages can be tied to factors that are 
are influencing, influencing diversification rate. We also find that speciation, or rather, uh, that extinction uh, appears to be important in producing this pattern. Um, at shallow phylogenetic scales, it's often difficult to detect any evidence for extinction. In fact, using molecular phylogenies to estimate extinction is difficult because you don't get to see any of the extinct taxa um, in most cases. But we do find sub -sig uh, some signature of extinction in our analysis uh, due to the presence of really young clades um, that have lots of species and old clades that have fuses. And the only way that you can get this pattern is if there's been turnover um, to, knock back, um, to knock back clades, uh, the richness of clades. Um, another pattern that we find that's uh, interesting is that these rate shifts don't necessarily coincide with, with our easy sort of armchair explanations that have been offered to explain diversity in some clades. Um, so for example, um, has been cited as a, a key innovation um, that explains patterns of species richness in birds. But what we find is that in the modern, there's one subclade that has an exceptional diversification rate compared to the other one. So, you know, flight doesn't explain species richness um, across birds. Now, that's a very simplistic hypothesis, and it, you know, we shouldn't be surprised when these simplistic hypotheses don't. You know, the, our analysis su suggests that there's something, um, most likely a series of events within this unresolved boreal enclade that have given rise, that explain the, the pulse of diversification or the, the great species richness of mammals. Um, and so these kinds of analyses can um, allow us to examine more closely or to search more closely for how to explain patterns of species richness. This provides a framework for identifying groups that really are exceptional versus those that are not, um, which can lead to further study. I'll show you now an example where we can use Medusa in a more direct way to test an old hypothesis or a previously developed hypothesis that explains species richness patterns in a group. Um, and I want to focus on the teleost radiation. So um, teleosts include about 20, almost 29,000 species. They're about half of all vertebrates and almost all of the ray finned fish. And so ichthyologists have really been interested in um, trying to understand uh, if anything, explains this uh, predominance of teleos in the modern fauna. In 1998, um, a new exciting sort of genomic sexy hypothesis was uh, advanced for explaining uh, teleos diversity. And this is, was tied um, this hypothesis, which I've abbreviated uh, FSGD, stand, which stands for the Fish Specific Genome Duplication Hypothesis. Um, uh, Subsequent workers to Amores found evidence for the genome duplicate. Um, then at the end of their studies uh, said, and this you know, is strong evidence that the teleos radiation is tied to the genome duplication. But actually, I would say there's two hypotheses here. And one is that there was a whole genome duplication. And this is making predictions about the number of gene paralogs and age and phylogenetic just distribution of uh, those paralogs. And, um, the second is that the duplication event spurred the teleost radiation, and that really hasn't been. And one of the reasons it has not been tested is, is because we don't have a phylogeny for, um, for, for ray finned fishes. Um, so what uh, we've done, what, uh, this is a study that was led by my postdoc, Francesco Santini, is uh, sample major lineages of the uh, uh, actinotorygians, um, again, with uh, extensive scouring of the literature to find as many fossils as we could to, con to uh, constrain fishes to representatives of taxa in the phylogeny. So here we've collapsed the phylogeny down to major groups, fishes, and then we use this diversity tree and analyze it with Medusa. So if we do that, um, we do find strong evidence for a shift in the rate of diversification on uh, the common ancestor of teleosts. But we find evidence for a second rate shift on this percomorph clade, again, which uh, you saw from the earlier analysis, and uh, for a clade that includes most of the osteriophysins. What's interesting about these um, later two rate shifts is that they're much younger than the teleost rate shift. And so um, it really is a mistake it's an oversimplification to say 
that the genome duplication event that occurred at, at the base of Telios could explain the standard, standing biodiversity of fishes. In fact, we have evidence that these other events, the Osteria rate shift and the Percomorph rate shift, um, which are much younger, uh, explain over 85% of the standing diversity of fishes. And there's been no hypothesis of a simple trait, um, a genomic expansion or otherwise, uh, for late. So this is, again, pointing out the need for, um, that we need to look more closely to understand patterns of diversification across, uh, across the teleos. Uh, Medusa also um, provides you with relative estimates of the diversification rate and extinction rate um, and generally provides um, a much more quantitative way of thinking about diversification in a large tree. Okay, so to conclude from uh, this part of the study, uh, we did find a rate shift leading to teleos and this is consistent with this uh, fish-specific genome duplication hypothesis, but we point out that even if this, is, this did duplication or the genomic expansion had something to do with diversification rates, it doesn't explain most of the diversity that we see in fishes. And in fact, there's rate shifts in these other younger groups um, that, that we need to explain. Okay, so um, to conclude uh, my talk, I want to say that with the advent of uh, larger and larger sequencing efforts and innovations in phylogenetic methods, there are opportunities to study um, diversification patterns at increasingly broad scales. And this will allow us to understand the tempo of diversification of living biodiversity. It will allow us to uh, test hypotheses of diversification that have been untestable as to now. And I think that this can provide a useful complement to paleontological studies of diversity through time. Um, so this is a figure from by Jack Sapkowski. Um, and there are, you know, if you think about the biodiversity of, uh, if you think about living biodiversity and fossil biodiversity, there is opportunity for those patterns to actually to be different. Um, I think that, however, one of the challenges is that these, uh, these workers that are studying uh, diversification in living taxa and in fossil taxa aren't talking very much to each other. And in fact, I think it's critical and important to find ways to integrate information from the fossil record with these molecular studies. Um, another challenge I think that will emerge is, uh, you know, the stuff that I've shown you today is largely based on um, a, a birth-death model. This is a model where um, rates of birth and death are constant over the phylogeny. We can allow uh, multiple places where the birth rate and the death rate can shift, um, but we can ask whether it really makes sense that a clade could um, diversify without any sort of limits. And so I want to talk about uh, work that my lab is doing to address some of these challenges right now. Um, so recently there was a book called The Time Tree of Life, that was published, and in it are time trees for all of the major groups of life. So there are 1,600, uh, over 1,600 tips, and they're all time calibrated to some, um, they're all time calibrated with, with some method. And so all of the kingdoms of phylum classes are represented. And so what we've been doing is through the um, tree of life and assigning diversity to the tips in this time tree. This is just a phylogeny for the green plants um, taken from the, we're not quite done with the whole time tree, but, um, and I don't even have much in the way of analyses to show you right now, but if we think about this, you know, four billion years of evolution um, on, this, on this time scale, it really raises a question of whether using a birth-death model or any kind of a constant rates model is the right approach. So um, we are collaborating with uh, Dan Rabalski, who will be here next week to give the seminar, um, to fit different kinds of models. Um, we're using these birth-death models, as well as models where the amount of species within a clade is not expected to change with time. This is a model that fits um, to the species richness data here um, for these models where diversification rate is specific to a lineage but doesn't change with time. 
And the second challenge I want to talk about is how we can extend, how we can start to incorporate fossil diversity. Um, and in fact, we've extended Medusa to incorporate fossil diversity. Um, if you think about one of these unresolved triangles where we have 25 extant species, um, it would be useful if we knew that at some period in the earlier history of this clade, if there was greater diversity, but um, tr the triangles right now, and I'll show you some, uh, an example of this using phylogeny that Klaus has provided me with. Um, so these are mustelids, uh, some more funny fish. And um, what we've done is, uh, well, what Klaus has done is scoured the paleo database and found um, the number of fossil species that are around for mustelids at various ages. And then he's assigned these to representatives um, within that mustelid phylogeny. So here's a collapsed clade of the mustelids in a Medusa analysis without those fossils. Uh, we find evidence for a rate shift here. And you know, these taxa just have one species, these uh, lineages just have one living species. So we estimate a low birth rate and no extinction. Um, and these guys have more species in them. And so we estimate a higher birth and death rate. But if you look at the fossil record, and what we've done is, what I'll show you today is just a preliminary analysis. Um, at 5.3 million years, there were two known fossils that can be assigned to this lineage. At that same time period, there were four of these. I don't even know what the hell they are, but <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Badgets, OK. Thank you. Um, there were uh, some death rates without considering that. If we incorporate that in our analysis, we still find evidence for a rate shift here. But if you compare the um, old estimates to the new estimates, you can see that they're quite different. So this is the net diversification. It's, it's still really slow. But now we know that there has been extinction on these branches. And in fact, um, the method is estimating a really high extinction rate. And similarly, the net diversification is slowed down. But we see lots of high turnover here as well. And this is due to the fact that the species richness on some of these lineages was much higher. Um, at this period of time. So that's a direction that we're working on. I'd like to thank um, my lab. Um, these are, um, that's Graham right there, uh, Francesco. <laughs> um, and I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators and uh, funding agencies, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you have no, if you have no fossil record, um, then your any results that you would do with uh, based on the extant taxa alone um, could be really changed if you knew something about the fossil record. Um, and so, um, in the absence of a fossil record, though, if you are, I mean, I guess what you would need to do is look to see if there are other um, signatures or other sources of information that would be consistent with your hypothesis. So if you think that there has been an adaptive radiation, I described some ways that you could look for um, patterns that would be consistent with that. And those um, would be specific to the, to the living um, members of the that clade, to the, to the crown group. Um, so even if you, you know, if you had more fossils, you might have a more nuanced picture of what was going on if some clade or subclade has um, a real concentration of diversification events in your reconstructed phylogeny, um, then even if the, you know, if the exact parameter values that a Medusa analysis would give you might change, um, I think that you can still make inferences that are biologically relevant to your study. I do think that it's, you know, there could be a, a lot of change in these methods over the next couple of years um, to um, either uh, have models that um, are better representations of ecological reality than, or 
that incorporate fossil information. Um, another thing that could happen, we're working on approaches that also use stratigraphic information and tie that with the likelihood um, that you get from looking at the lift. So you may not have a fossil record for your group, but if you're willing to assume that the pattern of diversification or the stratigraphic record for another group or for at some period earlier in the history of your tree is reasonable to use, then you can um, incorporate fossil information um, in that manner also. Yeah? What is the nature of the evidence for uh, this Helios genomic level duplication? Um, so this is, um, let me go back here. So um, Amores uh, was studying Hox genes um, and found evidence for application um, of Hox um, clusters here. Um, subsequently, other workers like Hogue have um, looked at gene families at the, and dated the ages of gene paralogs um, and and found copies in, you know, in Telios and not in um, the sister groups to uh, Telios. So well, there are individual groups of genes that duplicated, individual genes that duplicated, but an entire genomic duplication is not drawn from that. Yeah. Well, I guess that's why um, this is. Uh, I would just say genomic expansion. But um, the my reading of the literature is that that's. Um, the, um, uh, yeah, um, but. Um, well, is it, is it uh, also seen in uh, uh, chromosome numbers or size? Is it seen in number of structural genes? Any other sources that would indicate a plane change? Well, I think it can be followed over a large fraction of the genome in terms of disease rates and so forth. So I, I think it is pretty comprehensively documented across the genes. There are duplicate genes across the genome, but not from a well, I think the implication is that there was one. Okay, but why I'm asking what the evidence for that is? Well, there's a there's a there's a lot of this kind of evidence that's distributed in a, in a mapping sense across the genome fairly comprehensively. Okay, but that's still not evidence for a four year. Yeah, I mean, the, the exact nature of, Zoom, of, of what happened is made you know, you need to be largely about, but there is seemingly. So, I mean, I'll, I'll just say that what we found is just evidence that there's a rate shift at the um, common ancestor of Telios, and there could be lots of explanations for it. And that, so all I'm saying is it's consistent with this idea that's out there in the literature, um, and I'm really not in a position to um, vigorously defend that hypothesis. My um, reading of the literature uh, suggests that, um, that it's accepted in uh, many circles, but... Um, I'll have to leave it at. Yeah, Bob. Mike, you talked about the team behavior explaining much of the pattern of diversification in whale. But I mean, it's also probably a habitat shift as well. There's no big deal when you take trap and inshore and move to pelagic and benthic, then that involves differences in the prey. But, uh, yeah. Um, well, we're, in, we're uh, collaborating with uh, Samantha Price um, at uh, UC Davis, and she has a more exhaustive set of characters um, that relate to the ecology um, of the cetaceans. And so um, we could do mapping with those sorts of characters, and we could compare in um, model uh, fit sort of framework whether um, a more of an ecological hypothesis um, is a better fit than um, a dietary uh, hypothesis. Um, there are methods I didn't show you, but we could, you know, there are also hypotheses that uh, diversification higher. So we didn't test those hypotheses explicitly, but those could also be tested and compared. Um, um, yeah, so I guess we should look um, at other possible explanations um, for body size evolution, um, but diet was something that was readily available to be coded, so. Malcolm.
Um, I think that um, functional studies um, are really an important part of understanding um, the interpreting patterns of diversification as adaptive radiations. And one of the criterion that Schluter has is this uh, um, phenotype uh, utility, that it's not enough to show the correlation. You also have to know how the trait relates to the environment. And so, yes, um, I'm presenting um, patterns of, uh, I'm showing correlation, cor correlational patterns. This is a, a limitation of doing phylogenetics and it uh, or taking a phylogenetic approach to these um, diversities. And so it's also important to know um, what the traits are doing in the, in the environment. Um, and, um, but there's, there's not a way to... Presumably you're dealing with a group where we know most of the animals out there. Okay, there aren't, I mean, you keep finding some new forms, but there aren't any, but a lot of them, except among the fishes. Now, among the fishes, there, there may be as many fishes that we don't know about as, as there are that we do. Uh, but something like the insects, for example, would be clearly a, a different ball of wax yeah. altogether. Yeah. And where we almost certainly only know maybe 20% or something like that, or, or the nematode. Yeah. Uh, if you try doing something like this with really biodiverse groups that we only know, or that we only know a small fraction, and there's a stochastic issue about which ones we happen to know about as compared to the ones we don't, would this work? Well, we're, we're grappling with that issue right now, and um, what I, I think we will try is to use the numbers um, that represent the best estimates um, and also try it again with numbers that represent sort of outside, um, outside estimates. And, you know, it's possible that we could really extend this into a sort of a Bayesian framework where we could try and model that uncertainty in the species richness um, with uh, some kind of a distribution. Um, in the absence of that, anything that we do would be sort of conditioned on what we know about the, those groups. And um, I think as long as that we uh, keep that in mind and are explicit that, you know, this is ba whatever conclusions we reach are based on these numbers and are explicit about those numbers. And, you know, that's what, that's the best that um, we can do, I think, right now. Um, but we do need to be explicit about that. Maybe one more question, oh. and then, uh, of course, we need to leave. <laughs> so if you try looking at what happens for, for groups that you have a good biologic, if you start sort of randomly removing a new world, you know, how, how much effect does it have, or whether you recover how much, or do you have... If you have uh, sort of missing... Uh, yeah, so that's going to have um, the larger the group, um, the... I mean, it really depends on the relative fraction that you're missing. But if you have an old uh, group that, that's pretty big, um, there are already large confidence envelopes on the size of a clade that you would expect under a birth-death process. You, you could get something that's big or something small. And the more time that's gone by, the more variance you would expect. So it'll have more of a, an effect on small clades than on really large clades. So that, I guess that could also save us a little bit for looking at these, these really species-rich groups. So if there's other questions for Mike, maybe you can catch him up here um, or uh, in his office. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you.